All right, and welcome to Fast Break Breakfast NBA Podcast. My name is Keith Parrish. I'm here once again with my buddy through the miracle of computer phone. I'm here with John Burr. John, how's it going? Uh, huh? Did you crack your liquid death? Mm, my Finlandia. Hardcore water? Man, straight from the Alps. Click, click. Is it even carbonated or is it just Oh, uh, yeah, I, get, I have to have carbonated. I, basically, everything in my life is a, a beer simulacrum. <laughs> <laughs> I have definitely switched over into the sparkling water. I don't know if it's the um, when I changed social classes. Uh, in the sure. past few years where I used to be like, you know, in Europe, it was like still water, please. And oh, yeah. now, uh, now I'm like, man, I'm paying for carbonated water at Kroger. Just like, uh, the shift from buying bottled water is one of the most explicit, um, illustrations of the power of advertising. Do you think, yo, it's just advertising? I mean, I never bought bottled water. It was just tap water. Just tap but water out suddenly, of the sink. But then suddenly we all did. Yeah. Okay. It just became, who even drinks tap water anymore? I remember the first time I had a LaCroix and I was like, what is this? This is disgusting. Mm. It's just, it's like, it's just, a, it's a memory of a flavor with the, with the burn of carbonation. Why in the world? And now I'm like, I am just a... Uh, Whatever. When you came up drinking delicious yeah. Coors Banquet in Miller High Life, you love the taste of an aluminum can. <laughs> well, that there's there's that part of it, um, the taste in the aluminum can. I had this conversation with someone recently, um, talking about Bud Light, and it's like I never had a Bud Light phase because I was late to drinking. Like I didn't, mm. I didn't, I didn't drink in college, and we, and even when I began drinking some, there was like a hipster assignment to like the the PBRs. Yeah, you, were like, you were blue mooning it, or yeah, uh huh, or not even no, not even blue moon. Like it was like the uh, drinking Lone Star and PBR. Uh, yeah, MGD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like whatever branding that had. I didn't want to be a Bud Light guy. Maybe the Bud right. Light advertising too broy over the top in well, my face. Well, also the can, the can is hideous. Uh, maybe that was it too. I but mean, I was but like, heavy, but heavy if I'm if beautiful... I'm going to an uh, alt country show and they got they got the high life bottles, that seems classier. I have two dollars. I can pay two dollars for a couple of who those. Who doesn't like a champagne jam? Yeah. Um. So I never really had a Bud Light phase because someone was telling me how they like every now and then they have nostalgia for the Bud sure. Light, and I'm like, I don't. Have, that's something I don't. I don't have in my life. Now Bud I'm going to have the only beers that I just could never drink. It was so bad. It's yeah. also like a. I think it's a rice beer or something. So it has a really strange taste. Is it? I don't to me, but yeah, so I I could drink most beers in great. Now, do qualities. I have a nostalgia for the sticky sweet flavor of Steel Reserve? Yes, maybe sometimes. Four um, four two. <laughs> there was that high gravity. There was beer. that one three month span before I met my partner, where uh, <laughs> the high gravity beer is starting. Some of the happening. worst worst hangovers a man can have. Going to the gas station, I have pulled together all my coins. I have seven dollars. Sweet, yeah. That's <laughs> that's called. You go to the Coin Star and then you go get your Steel Reserve. Uh, speaking of Coin Star and high gravity alcohol, John, what was your breakfast? Um, I, I I'm worried this is going to sound like McGaw's slander, but I want to relay a story. Oh, okay, please. Um, so I've never liked pancakes, right? Don't like them. Think they're gross. Right. This is also where we once again reemphasize: none of us are obsessed with breakfast. We right. just thought the name was fun. Yeah. Fast break breakfast. Fun to say. Looks it great. Gave written us down. An angle. Yeah. Some it's people get it about, years but... later. Yeah. Um. Anyways, go ahead. I don't like pancakes, but I didn't used to love donuts. But McGaws has kind of changed things, and I love donuts. But yeah. I went to McGaws today, and they're completely slammed. I'm not slandering the donut divas. Sometimes this is going to happen. Uh, my is blueberry donut, my blueberry donut was completely undercooked. Oh no! To the point where I could only take one bite. But it was interesting because that one bite, an undercooked donut, it's a pancake. <laughs> it was the same thing. I really? make pancakes all the time for my child now. Yeah, blueberry pancakes to be yeah. precise. Yeah, it was sure. The same thing. So if anyone ever, you know, you know, wants to. Experience an are undercooked you, donut, or perhaps, so, 
maybe to- cook a pancake longer and see if it becomes a donut. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Uh, I think there's some science to be done here. I think any of our chefs and or bakers out there, uh, let us know. If you keep cooking a pancake, um, how long before it becomes a donut? Or maybe if you fry a pancake instead of uh, maybe if you took pancake batter and just deep fried it instead, is that a donut? Maybe it is. What? Maybe curious. this is maybe this is the next the next Nashville rich person fad. We had the croissant plus donut became the cronut. What's our pancake <clears throat> plus Still donut? Never had a cronut. Need to do that. Dough cake, panut. How about a panut? Panina. You think you can sell some panuts? Donini. <laughs> My breakfast, um, Mother's Day happened. You know, a few. Uh, yeah, few, technically few, this was yesterday, but a few days ago. Um, uh, for Mother's Day, got my wife a giant cookie cake, um, or just a giant cookie. They call it a cookie cake. It's not a cake. It's a, just a cookie. It's a huge cookie. Um, and uh, and it was so huge. And, it was so huge initially. She's like, yeah, you can have all you want. But then she remembered that I'm a, a cookie candy monster. And she's like, no, no, you yes. got to stop eating it. You gotta stop. So then well, I didn't... she doesn't want you to enjoy yourself either. That's part right, of it. Right, right. Uh, then it, then a couple of days went by. So well, mo- actually, we got the tour on Friday. Picked it up on Friday. So it was an early Mother's Day. Uh, I snacked on it some Saturday, some Sunday. Then she said, hey, no, stay away. So Monday, Tuesday, didn't touch it. Wednesday, finally, yesterday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, she's like, <clears> this, <throat> this is going bad. You can now commence uh, finishing it off. And so for breakfast, I had, um, we'll call it six-day-old Great American Cookie Company giant cookie. And honestly, amazing. Spectacular. If you let a cookie uh, age long enough, it actually reverse turns into donuts. A little soft. Oh. Kind of okay. maybe or maybe closer. Are we to- all just yeah. phases of donut? <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually thought of you uh, quite a bit this week, and I thought maybe you could answer. Yeah. Some questions that have been torturing me. What's this? So I just had to do like a lot of single parenting, right? Yeah. My uh, old lady was gone for like three to five days. It all blends together. Um, uh, and so as a result, on some days I did nothing but parent. <clears throat> yeah. I had always heard and always believed that it was the hardest job there is. So it's not. So what do I do with this information? It's kind of, I still think it's difficult. Yeah. But it's pretty, it's like way more rewarding than most jobs. It's very rewarding. And then also like there's fun, which there is in my fun. experience, I have almost no fun job. Well, so you said, you to make sure I understand correctly, you said right. you parented a full day on Sunday. I had two days of full parenting. Okay. I and think three days what, of like half. half I think work, what half we're parenting. discussing right now is the concept of novelty work. Mm, yeah, that's where I like, hey, I, I went and worked with some Teamsters one day and set right. up a stage and it was 16 hours. And I was like, man, this is nuts. This is kind of um, fun yeah. for novelty. But if I work. had to do it every yeah. day. Yeah, But if you actually had to do it. No, thank yeah. you. Uh, I couldn't there, help but think at the end of it, I was like. How do I get into this stay at home dad stuff? So, so that, so this is, so I have, I have experience. And I, you've in this. had some experience. I have so I exact curious. experience in this. I was like, I yeah. presented to my wife, listen, you're looking for a stay at home man. I can do yes. this. Let's have right. kids. I, you have your career. I will take care of the kids. And when we had that baby, no. And I was like, this well, kind of Also, sucks. my child is three. Yeah, your child is fun now. Two, three those is first fun. two years yeah. seemed super bad. Like, I was afraid of it. So when now, we had now I'm like, wow, this is when pretty... we had like the three year old and the baby, right. I was like, I've never had a full time job. I've never had a career. I want Give one bad. Me. Yeah, I like I, I I this is not that much fun. This is actually exhausting. Right. Uh, part of that is because I'm one of the laziest humans in the world. And I'd spent Check my entire out. adult life just uh, entrenching these bad habits of I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I can watch Law & Order any time of the day I want. <laughs> I can go out and just do whatever I want, whenever. So then when it was kids, I'm like, this I, is exhausting. I should probably amend all of this with I'm also a very bad parent yeah. who will let my child, like, watch horror films. Right, yeah. So I don't even, we, we don't do tablets. We don't even let them use, like, oh! they can't watch Disney Plus on we the watch, iPad. They can't play games. Things. We, so I know I was a, like, yeah, John, speaking of novelty work. So we have, you know, for our Grizzlies watch parties in Nashville, 
uh, I laminated some things. So they, because the people were spilling, we have these, you know, these confusing forms for how you win raffle prizes, all that stuff. So I, I went, I went to the FedEx Kinkos or whatever it's called, um, to, uh, to, to laminate some things. And they were like, Hey, it's going to be like $3 a sheet to laminate. I'm like, that's way too expensive. That's absurd. And they're like, but Hey, you can do it for your, you, they can do it yourself. And it costs like 50 cents. I'm like, Oh, well, I'll do that. And I started laminating stuff. And I was like, this is so much fun. <laughs> I was like, man, using the laminator, this is delightful. And then I go and cut it with this blade. That, like, this is super fun. I could do this for exactly one day yeah, and have yeah, yeah, yeah. and have a lot of fun doing this um, for one day. But no, that's novelty work. Uh, no, man. I don't want to do it. Yeah. It was so much more rewarding. And I, there were, I couldn't believe I was having fun again during yeah. the day. Yeah. I was like, man, I want to get in on this. I dug a ditch in front of my home to control stormwater runoff. And when I was done, I felt amazing. I had like yeah, a I, testosterone I boost where I'm like, I did that. I don't, get I don't want to dig ditches every day, man. No, I, I, if it's physically exhausting, that's where I check out. But yeah. now I am going to spend the rest of my days. Like, unfortunately, I, we don't, we're not secure enough to where I could quit my job. I will spend the rest of my days wondering if maybe, just maybe, I could be the happiest, worst father in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the key, the key with anything, just switch it up. Just variety. I think just need a little, little variety of work uh, doing the same podcast for nine years. Meh, no, thank you. I'm mm -hmm. um, just going to switch it up a little bit. Um, anyways, those were our breakfasts. After our breakfasts, we move to our breakfast in bed. Apologies. This is our chance to make right what we might have gotten wrong. In a previous episode, it's frequently the first time we talk about the NBA, which the show is supposed to be about. John, what would you like to apologize for? Well, I don't think I had as many like actual screw ups as I'm used to on a weekly basis, just because there's so few games. But um, I guess I will apologize to Jimmy Butler and the Heat for not thinking that they had much of a chance in this series. Um, I know it's one game, and for me, really only one quarter. I pretty much only caught the fourth. You and Joe Missoula saying it's only one quarter. <clears throat> That's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, if you if you take it by quarters, the, the Celtics did technically win. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, um, up th they're up three quarters to one. Yeah, but um, I feel, I don't know, kind of, I'm coin flippy again on this series. Well, how many times can we apologize to the Heat now, John? I mean, I, I same thing. I'm working on three straight rounds. Yeah, three straight rounds. They they big boyed the Celtics. They did the thing they do, which is just I they was have... really impressed. I know Butler's always there, but I was really impressed. Adebayo seemed like a different player to me and what he was great. I watched. He was very um decisive in whether he wanted to attack or take accept the mid range. And from what I watched, um I hate to keep doing this to the man. But I, f I felt like Missoula was kind of in the deep end. Yeah. You actually um, have, um, John, I mean, you should know from all these years of podcasting, you never admit how little you watch. So I know, but just to I stay know, I went by, back and watched. you've got this music conference thing you're doing. You've been solo parenting. I went back and I went back and yeah. watched the, you know, the thing where yeah. they cut out all the commercials and all the stupid plays. Yeah. So I felt like, but, I, but you could see like the shapes on the court. And like Spolster was tinkering and, and, and there was some masterful stuff going on. And like he would do something stupid, like put in Duncan Robinson, he would immediately take him out. <laughs> I mean, the Duncan, Duncan was, I mean, the Duncan, so what, the, one of the, the stories. Duncan, the Duncan Robinson plus zone was like my favorite thing ever. Also, let me apologize to Kevin Love. I forgot how beautiful and how uh, uh, almost your spirit leaving your body pure, what, just a, a perfectly placed Kevin Love outlet bomb. He's been doing it all playoffs. So beautiful. I mean, we. this is just like, I, I know we've been doing the same podcast for nine years and or the last, you know, two months. The whole, the Cavs couldn't use this guy. Kevin Love was just saving it. Kyle Lowry's now all of a sudden back. Um, Bam had a great game. We knew what Kyle was doing. Jimmy looks, <laughs> Jimmy is Michael Jordan. Like yes. this is what, kids, if you weren't around, yeah. if you weren't around in 1992, you weren't around in 1996. This is what Jordan did. The game was yeah. way different back then. There wasn't these huge swings of some teams make 20, 22 three pointers a night that that right. basically decides the game. <laughs> it was a man, a wing player by just it seemed like a 
uh, there's force of there's will. There's been two Jordan esque, um, Larry esque, Magic esque players in the playoffs to me, and it's been LeBron, despite missing every single shot, and Jimmy, where they're just taking over games uh, with their mind. So LeBron is <clears throat> LeBron is in my memory. And again, this is more hagiography and not mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but LeBron is old magic to me right now. Yeah. And w- again, old magic was amazing. And then uh, I thought you were going to say, uh, Jokic is magic plus Larry. Just period. Jokic is operating on another level where it's another not plane. Just yeah. taking over uh, games with their mind. He's actually just dominating with his entire but, corporeal. But form. Jimmy is Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy's doing a full Michael Jordan. The six steals he got in this game, the four steals in the second half, uh, the way the Heat just took over that third quarter, and then we're in control. And it was just the way Jimmy, I think, elevates his teammates. I mean, maybe we need to start giving more respect to the Gabe Vincents. Like, Gabe Vincent and Max Truce are just they're love, solid. Solid and Chuck, guys. And Chuck had always told me that his the love affair with Gabe is real. I mean, yeah. I love Gabe Vincent. Like, yep. And it's little things, like, Knowing when to foul someone really hard, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gabe Vincent knows when to do that. But also, you're you're seeing this continued postseason for the Heat. All their shooting percentages are good, and one of the main things that people highlighted for, again for this Celtics series, it looks like the Celtics have way more talent. They also shoot the three ball way better. The Heat made six more three pointers than the Celtics did in this game, and it's been consistent now. Basically, and I'm not. Every I'm round, any, the Heat, everyone, they, they just shoot a good percentage. And I'm not uh, writing off the Celtics in any way. Uh, they have been up against it so many times and have responded uh, to the adversity with aplomb every time. I, I'm not even mad at Joe Missoula, and I'm actually quite pickled, uh, tickled with the guy, uh, as we'll get into later. But um, it's just, you know, it, it's interesting watching. I, <clears throat> I think the, the Heat have shown – that they have another gear they can get into not only as players, but as an organization. And it's kind of frustrating. (laughs) Yeah. You have, you have, I mean, Jimmy Butler, who doesn't shoot three pointers in the regular season. He's two for four last night. Well, he's 37 and a half percent for the entire playoffs. He's taken nearly four a game. Uh, Kyle Lowry, Max Drews, Caleb Martin, uh, Duncan Robinson, all shooting 38% or higher. Um, and it's like they just they're just all making shots. And then I mean, Missoula, I think Missoula, besides the on court strategy, like Marcus Smart sort of threw him under the bus. He's like, yeah, uh, yeah. What about the not t- no time? Yeah, he doesn't thing. call doesn't call timeout for us. I mean, they gave up mm-hmm. forty six points. They were up was it like seventy two to fifty nine, and then it was just the runaway. It was Kevin Love making the yeah. like Kevin Love hitting pull up three pointers, and now the Heat have this one zero lead. I mean, they're nine and two when Jimmy Butler plays this postseason. I think they're whether well, they're nine and three overall. So I mean, but still, like the Heat are incredible, and yeah, I guess we can always continually apologize to them. Um, it's just an per- apology in perpetual motion. Also, <laughs> should we uh, should we apologize to whatever um, uh, evil spirit, spook, or hate uh, scared the bejesus out of Tatum that made him soil himself on the court in the final minutes? The double uh, travel, c- consecutive travels. The second one unbelievably obvious and he threw a fit like he didn't do it like he jumped up in the air and tried to start his dribble airborne yeah that was that was scary for me that that's one of my favorite moments of the, of the entire playoff so far as the double travel <laughs> i haven't laughed that heartily at i just texted ha ha funny. ha to every basketball fan i knew yeah everyone knew exactly what i was talking about at that moment um my apology last episode i misspoke where i said the celtics fired doc rivers obviously um the uh the Sixers let Doc Rivers go. Didn't they, though? You're just a little well, uh, Wasn't that a trade? They he traded kind of, him. It to was the a Clippers. trade. Yeah. yeah, they traded him to the Clippers. Um, also, I can apologize. During... Actually, the Celtics did fire Doc Rivers. Who traded who? Did it? Wasn't there a trade? They just beat the, Doc... the Sixers in Game Seven and humiliated him and effectively fired him off of the Sixers. I can't remember the history, but we can like now apologize ass- for this. It was like an week. assisted firing. <laughs> um, my uh, another apology last. Uh, last week when I went on my huge, I'll call it propaganda spiel against the Hustle Award, where maybe I selectively chose things to support my argument. I still don't think there's an objective argument that Marcus Smart, based on the stats they give us, is the deserving winner of the Hustle Award. But I did find out uh, some of our listeners did some research. Uh, I believe Caleb looked it up. They did have a top five 
uh, released for this award. I was saying this is new. Apparently, they used to do it like a rotisserie fantasy basketball league where they actually assigned a score based on each wow. category, and then they tabulated it up. Again, that's way more fair than whatever they're doing right now. Um, so I was wrong there. Also, I omitted the box out stat, which apparently the NBA was really into the box out stat. That was in their release. I, of course, left that, left that out on purpose. The stat they used, the pro smart argument, the pro market smart argument they were using was um, he had this really high box out number. Even if he never grabbed the rebounds himself, his team always grabbed the rebounds. Again, we can interpret these stats however we want, but maybe I left out some things that could have given a, a more fair argument, but it, it it weakened the segment. So why am I going to do that? So anyways, um, that. So what you're telling me is the Hustle Award is for best boxing out by a guard. I think that's the best way we can interpret it, as long as his teammates grab the rebounds and not Got him. It. That's the way we're interpreting it. Anyways, um, those were our apologies. Before we get to our steak and eggs best thing, Got a word from our sponsor. Download the brand new official Grind City Media mobile app. Explore new ways to access your favorite Grind City Media content from your favorite shows and series to news and entertainment. Stay connected with exclusive content at your fingertips with the Grind City Media mobile app available in both the Apple and Google Play stores. Also, this podcast, Fast Break Breakfast, and also my Grizzlies podcast, Grits and Grinds, are available on YouTube. If you want to watch our facial expressions as we deliver this uh, spectacular content, do it over at YouTube. Subscribe to Fast Break Breakfast. Subscribe to Grits and Grinds over on YouTube. All right, steak and eggs, best thing, John. A lot of things have happened since uh, we last spoke the conference finals have tipped off. The NBA lottery happened. Um, what among those things or something else uh, was your steak and eggs best thing? Let's stay on the Missoula tip. Uh, I have learned uh, via an article I will not attribute. Um, Joe Missoula. Yep. To inspire him and I assume get him in some sort of Bostonian mindset. Watches the Ben Affleck directed movie, The Town, four times a week. Is Joe Missoula a ringer employee? Is he trying to curry favor with Bill Simmons? It's not a bad ploy. If you're going to coach the Celtics. Will, will we see him on the rewatchables next year? I we think they've hopefully. done the town twice already. Hopefully, <laughs> They should do rewatchables for their episodes about the town. The re-listenable rewatchables. The town, first of all, if you're an NBA head coach, do you really have nine hours a week? To watch this this movie four times? Tom Thibodeau is pissed off just hearing about this. I mean, Tom Thibodeau <laughs> doesn't have a a wife or partner or love yeah. interest. Because Tom Thibodeau he's gave up to sex his organs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, come he, on. He's doing film work. You're telling me Joe Missoula? Like, is, does he have Joe Missoula takes film work Is it like level. a restaurant or a bar where it's just on in the background? Has to be. This has to be his comfort food. He sleeps to Jeremy Renner's dulcet tones. So, I don't know your opinion of the town. At least I'm not sure. Pretty good. It's the best Ben Affleck movie. I like the best the, Ben Affleck directed movie. I like the town. I think it's yeah. entertaining. But Jeremy Renner's amazing in it. I don't love the town. I don't feel like the story even totally works because I don't feel like the protagonists are likable. I feel like a wow. great heist They're movie. They're likable in comparison to John Hamm, the least likable actor. Well, so John Hamm is a boring actor usually, but I yeah. like his character more than I do any of like the bank robbers. Oh. I feel like that's a failure for the filmmakers. Maybe it's a failure for me. But like Heat. So we we love Heat, John. Heat. Sure, the town is like silly Heat. It is. It's silly Heat. But Heat, like you are cheering for Neil. And you're cheering for uh, Val Kilmer's character. And like Tom Sizemore is a terrible person because he uses a child as a human shield in a yeah, shootout. But, but for him, the action is the juice. But you're still like, maybe he's misunderstood. Slip. Like, like you're cheering for you're cheering for the I mean, bad I guys. cheered for Tom Sizemore in a uh in a civil suit where he was accused of beating the madam of Hollywood. So <laughs> yeah, please, Tom Sizemore is just kind of one of those guys. That's an unbelievable 2005 reference that no one remembers. <laughs> um, the uh, No, but like these movies where you have like um, criminals and there's like a, a cop or like the fugitive, the fugitive is brilliant because right. the antagonist is Tommy Lee Jones, but you end up liking the antagonist and he ends up being a double protagonist. It works in the town. 
I don't feel like why should Jeremy you didn't like the Ren like, dog in the town? Like, why should they get away? They're just bad people. They're overtly bad people. There's nothing amazing. They don't even something, do like something weird like orange. I they don't, don't know. even they don't even do stuff with John Ham's character where you're like, oh, he's secretly a really bad dude. Oh, yeah. he doesn't pay child support. Like just do like I don't know. I when I watch the town, I'm like, I'm not cheering for them to get away. Uh so I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe that's just on me. But no, I would say that uh, Ben Affleck is not a competent storyteller. So you have it there. <laughs> he built he built a, an entire movie around the portmanteau uh, horrible line of Argo bleep yourself. Yeah, and one best director one, for one best picture ultimate, for that John. The ultimate reward. So <laughs> uh, um, we have a we have a listener question about this. Um, Patrick Kirtner wants to know. Um, Joe Missoula has a fixation on the movie The Town and incorporates its lessons into his coaching. By the way, next question, this is my question, what lessons are there in The Town? Anyways, uh, Patrick wants to know, if an NBA team hired you as head coach, what film would you build your persona and coaching philosophy around? Hmm. Kind of torn between two rather obscure films. Roger Avery's Rules of Attraction. Oh, wow. Uh, is that the, the ones in the 2000s or is there another one? The ones in the 2000s starring uh, the yeah. guy from... Uh, Josh Jackson, is that his name? No, but it's the other guy from... Josh Hartnett? What is that? No, it's, it's no, the uh, other guy. No, Dawson's Creek guy? Yes, the other guy from Dawson's Creek. I can't Creek. even remember yes. this movie, yeah. barely. I can't, yeah, and I don't even know that guy's name, I don't think. Um, the Rules of Attraction, where you kind of like sociopathologically take over your entire college campus through... Um, James Van Der Beek. Malfeasance. James Van Der Beek. Or uh, similarly, the movie Ravenous, directed by Antonia Bird, where you uh, literally eat your opponents, because that's the type of oh, that's uh, that's Jimmy the lesson? Butler-esque okay. lessons. Uh, I, I want you know Machiavellian uh, lessons to be passed on to my players. If I've learned anything this uh, postseason, uh, it's the who dares wins, the sneaky bastards type mentality, the guys yeah. who uh, didn't care much about uh, the regular season. Uh, and saved all their uh, saved all, saved their fangs for the playoffs. Those are the guys you want. Yeah, um, I think I will take. Um, I think I'll take Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia, hmm. which has a very over the top theme. Of if you don't respect acknowledge the uh, respect the well, scene. there's there's that Name one. The uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, yeah. Um, there's the theme of if you don't acknowledge the past and ask for forgiveness, like you're going to be a damaged person and things will not work out for you. There's also the kind there's of also the theme frogs, just frogs. Well, there's also the theme that there are random occurrences that just happen, that things just happen. And I do think NBA teams need to one, acknowledge their errors, not stick to like this dogmatic. Oh, we did things right. We made the right decisions. Um, we won three out of the four quarters. Uh, analytics say we should have won. Our expected points were more. Um, we have a philosophy of maybe compiling assets over winning is better. Don't dogmatically stick to one thing. Acknowledge um, one where you can correct and and atone for past mistakes, but also uh, just say, hey, guess what? There's randomness, and we have to work with whatever happens. So, I think I would go with Magnolia. I don't know. Magnolia, if one of those um, movies you watch when you're a young person and you think is brilliant, and then you right. watch as a 40 year old man, you're like, uh, this doesn't make sense, and this director was on cocaine and had no rules. Yeah, I I do. I I still I, I've rewatched it and still like it, but I understand it's one of those things I respect any argument of a person being like, yo, this is terrible. I can't take this. Yeah, this yeah. Is, this, like, is, I, it, yeah. this is it, way too on the nose. It embarrasses. Like, oh, when I, I watch it. it, I get yeah. super embarrassed for the, the filmmaker and everyone involved. Although it is nice to see like I oh, mean, I can't believe I can't remember names again, but uh John um We're old. the guy from Boogie Nights John um, C. Riley. Uh, yes, it's nice to see John C. Riley in a movie when he was an actor before he just became like, oh yeah, yeah, the <laughs> Jerry Bus like, like oh Showtime what? guy, Showtime like, coming out season two, yeah, a caricature like, of himself. I yeah. mean, he was like one of the best actors alive, and now he's just. So, it shows you how like the moves you make with your career they matter. You need you know to be how, Jimmy Butler. You can't be so, uh, Chris Paul. So you know how all movies now, especially Marvel movies, are basically assembled for people on YouTube to highlight the Easter eggs and say, sure. like, this means this, this means this. Yeah, Maybe yeah. it was the novelty of this occurring in, like, 2001 or whenever the movie came out where it was like, hey, look, that rope right there spells out a, a Bible verse. Or, like, oh, it God. says, hey, it, it, there's a – and then you go look up the Bible verse, like, oh, that's the theme of the movie. 
And then maybe that was for more of a novelty. And now it's just like, it's so overt where you're like, oh, get out of town. You um, must've gone crazy when you saw Cloverfield. Were you on there watching? Were you on the websites? <laughs> I am. I am. A, I am a big Cloverfield. The only JJ Abrams thing I like, um, mm. which is my, uh, uh, I guess my weird movie take there. Um, I'll do my best thing. Um, my best thing. I guess lottery adjacent. Yeah, maybe it's not fair that the Spurs ended up with another ideal, perfectly um, executed tank, end up with Victor Wimbanyama. But I am excited, just as we as we look ahead past the finals and we think about the offseason, I am excited, and my best thing is just the number of different options where the Spurs can go as far as team building. If Wimbanyama is this transformational talent, like everyone says he is, a guy who just by showing up adds 15 wins to your team, like Shaq or Dwight Howard or Alonzo Mourning or Evan Mobley or whoever else. Like, if he's that, Yao Ming, if he's that good, we're all sending your 10 wins, 15 wins better. Well, guess what? The Spurs are going to be in the play-in. If you're going to be in the play-in, ain't no point of tanking. Ain't no point of trying to go for that top draft pick. So you might as well try to be good. And the Spurs have cap space. They have Wimbenyama and cap space. They have some fun players in Keldon Johnson, Devin Vassell, uh, Jeremy Sohan. Uh, and they can just do stuff. And so, like, hey, you want to take a, a salary of, I don't know, Tobias Harris, a, a useful player? You can. Do you want to take... Uh, a heavily discounted DeAndre Ayton? Yeah, you could. Uh, do you want to trade for just Clint Capella or somebody who's pretty good? Yeah, you probably could. Do you want to take Chris Paul? Yeah, maybe. Do you want to form a coaching super staff, have a reunion with Mike Budenholzer and Monty Williams coming back to town? You could. So, like, I think all the opportunities that are that are open to the Spurs and the fact that, hey, you know what? Being bad, probably off the table, gets me very excited about what they could build there. Well, let's uh, throw in a listener submitted question from Drew then. Better young team situation, OKC or the aforementioned San Antonio? It's still OKC. It's, really? Well, so okay. I think Wimbanyana completely flips it on its head and makes it a slam okay. dunk Spurs okay. thing. <clears throat> and plus, I think like the young players on, uh, you know, Take SGA out of it, of, of course, but I think the young I'm not players... taking the. I'm not taking. Why am I taking SGA? SGA is the swinging. Well, let's say for me. let's say we'll, we'll take Wimbenyana and SGA, and we'll stick them over here. Okay. Because if Wimbenyana isn't at least as good as SGA, then we have been misled. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, then we look at the rosters, and I think OKC's and and uh, and Spurs are not that much demonstrably. You know, diff I think the 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 youth and talent on the on the Spurs is is equal. I think you know, Devin Vassell and Keldon Johnson and those guys are still really young, and you know, Sohan like. So where all right? So if we're, if we're drafting players on the Spurs and the Thunder, and we're saying in this exercise you can just have them on your franchise, and right, um, I think I would take Jalen Williams first out of everyone left. I yeah, think that's, I, that's like podcaster craziness, though. No, that, that so that's podcaster brain. Where I'm still yeah, taking the I'm still taking the potential. Real. Well, who are you saying? You think Keldon Johnson or Devin Vassell is a more sure both of them? Okay. No, I I would much rather have Jalen Williams than Keldon Johnson. I think Devin Vassell, maybe yeah, I yeah, I'm still going Jalen Williams. I think. Um, I'm just I glad you didn't say Josh Giddy. I was going to log off. No, no, <laughs> but like. I don't. I don't know. Well, I like. I don't think. I don't far. think Keldon Johnson or Devin Vassell. I don't think their ceiling is top even three player on like a conference finals team. And I think Jalen Williams Fair. still has a ceiling of being a top three player on a conference finals team. That might be at his peak. And I might be. I really, I really like Jalen Williams, but this, the flashes he's shown are in the context of a very bad team. Um, they made the play in and the Spurs tanked out. You're talking about the Spurs yeah, context yeah, yeah. for those but, guys. Well, I'm just saying the flashes he showed are on a very yeah. bad team. And he's still like the third best player on that team. Yeah. Um. You know, as a so as a rookie. Yeah. So like, I'm not like, I I still could see him just being like a Keldon Johnson. Or oh, of course. A Devin of course. Um, and then you know, I think I I just think they're pretty similar. And then you have the second best prospect in modern NBA history. You add yeah. that to them. Uh, so I don't think, think Jalen Williams is enough to offset the Wimbanyama. So we have, and again, so this goes back to the Shea versus Wimbanyama thing, where like mm -hmm. 
Shea's a proven all NBA guy. And I very good. I just take a I take a proven all NBA guy over the the question mark box of top prospects. We also of all time. we also um talk about OKC in the context of are they even going to keep Shea? We've had conversations about this and stuff like that. Well, I think we've turned Whereas that corner. We right? talk about we talk about the San Antonio Spurs as one of the premier organizations in all of sports yep. with the best coach. It's true. Although no, so one, I think I think we don't, we don't believe about, Pop is still the best coach, right? Do we? I still, he's, I still very good. I, I have okay. no, it, you know, I, I, I don't know who I. When he refused to foul in that final playoff game against the Nuggets, with that couple, that was like three years ago. The last time they played games that matters. <laughs> he took a hit. He's like, let's get out of here. Let's, I don't care. Let's get, let's, let's get out of here. No, let's, let's, so, John. I want to hear yours. So, um, let's. If you're picking between all the players. Um, on Thunder and Spurs, and we haven't even mentioned that the Thunder have all the draft picks. That the Spurs do not have these extra draft picks. Right. But like, and again, that's that weighs heavily on me taking the the Thunder if I'm picking between which young core or whatever situation I want more. Um, who do you? Who is your first pick between the non Wimbenyama Shea Gilders Alexander players on the Thunder and Spurs? Um. Well, like I said, I just I just think that they're. It's like six of one, half dozen of the other. Like I'm okay. fine with Devin Vassell or Kelvin Johnson over yeah. any of the Thunder players. Uh, like it doesn't bother over me Holmgren. To do that. The what can Holmgren? Yeah, be? sure. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, uh, um, and then I think that the Spurs organization and and franchise is a huge plus over what what we what we have in OKC. I'm really glad that the OKC thing has started to come together, yeah. but it was a surprise to everyone. It was a surprise to everyone. And, and they, we were talking about over. them jettisoning yeah. SGA at the beginning of this year. Right. Uh, so I'm not really ready to crown the ass. Whereas right. I have seen San Antonio purposefully tank and land the preeminent player before. I've seen this movie before. I wouldn't be surprised if they're good again really quickly. You if know? we're talking about tank efficiency, Spurs unparalleled. 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 If you want to talk about tanking volume? Thunder. <laughs> well, I mean, the Thunder didn't even do the right volume. Behind the Sixers, they yeah. never even got what what was their highest? They got Holmgren. Um, that yeah. that was the high one. The other ones got them giddy. Um, uh, they still got Poku. You wanna, you're forgetting Poku. I do love Poku. I mean, this is like two great situations, but yeah, to me, I'm like more excited for. I think the Spurs will be a, a force sooner. I mean, the Thunder, the Thunder also have massive cap space. Like yeah. they could, they could give Dylan Brooks everything he wants. Um, well, then they'll instantly be bad. <laughs> um, uh, there, you can kiss your Jalen Williams dreams goodbye if you've got Dylan in town. <laughs> uh, those were our best things. The opposite of our steak and eggs best thing is our cream of wheat worst thing. John, what's your uh, what's your cream of wheat worst thing? So I almost had like a perfect basketball evening the other night where my one of my favorite players delivers. What was going to be one? Of, it may still be one of the great playoff performances. Jokic absolutely dominating the Lakers, but they screwed it up. They gave the Lakers one of those losses where you feel like you win moments. They let them back in. They kind of left a crack in the door. If they had really smashed the Lakers into oblivion like that, Jokic has one of the best games ever. They're just laughing and joking as they blow them out. I think it's a gives them a much better, much uh, more authoritative stamp on the series. Them letting the Lakers do, have whatever they want in that fourth quarter. And uh, I, I, I it, it was the, for me, I was just like, oh no, don't let them do it. Cause you know, I thought maybe the Lakers were going to win with about six minutes left. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I thought they were, luckily they didn't waste one of the great performances and Jokic, you know, did his clutch Jokic thing at the end, made his free throws got the tough loose balls but i don't think you can in this playoff situation especially against that team let them stick around and start to figure things out every every second is counting with lebron and anthony davis right now and they are figuring things out on the fly and you just you need to put them out of the game you need to put them out of your misery especially when the home court is so important to you like that so, so it just you know I, we're nitpicking here but it felt bad to me I so I I guess I disagree with you on this. Sure. Like I think this was the Nuggets eighth win in the conference finals ever. Mm -hmm. Like they have no history of doing this. The fact that the fact that they won and can kind of feel bad about the win 
You to me, it that's, helps them in the long run. That's great. It like, like the, galvanizes the, them. Well, the fact that they, they almost gave it away. I, I Even Mike Malone mentioned this. He's like, the fact that we have so much on tape that we need to fix. Dude. But we look Mike at it Malone, after a, a, a win is a great thing. Mike, yeah. Mike Malone begging them to put D'Lo back in in a roundabout way is oh, the most that's galaxy some, brain crap I've ever seen. That was mind games. Mike, Mike, Michael Malone, after the game, he's like, oh. Did he did wink you, at the camera? He said, like, did, they, they didn't play D'Angelo Russell in the fourth quarter. That's interesting. That's something they got to figure out. Like, just <laughs> calling out the guy who'd be like, oh, man. Um, incredible mind games there. No, I, I who, think the, who who as a coach has made the biggest leaps in this playoffs in your eyes, Malone or Ham? Because they both are like gods now. Well, Ham, Ham <laughs> came from nowhere to this, yeah. and I'm like, I love this guy. And again, I told you, dude, he won. Don't you feel like if Ham was the Grizzlies coach, none of the bad things happen? I don't. Well, that's I can't open that box. I don't know how. how I feel I like none of them happen. I feel I like know. halfway through Dylan being like. I poke bears. Ham like comes up and tackles him. He's like, stop talking. He's like, yeah, he's like, you're on the bench now. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's another story for another day. Um, the, the way that the Lakers got these performances, I mean, LeBron's going to do it every game because LeBron's incredible. But like Anthony Davis was unbelievably good. Yep. You had Rui with another, another good game. Um, but also like, I mean, I guess you could play the same game with the Nuggets where KCP was awesome. Um, Awesome in this game. He maybe Casey Peace is built for the conference finals. He's unbelievable. I think the Nuggets holding on to this one, getting up to the big lead, um, having it basically totally slip away, still finding a way to win. The big adjustment everyone talked about where Darvin Ham went to Rui Hachimura guarding Jokic. They had Aaron Gordon in the dunker spot. And everyone's online getting mad about like get AD out of you gotta get AD away from the paint. Like Jokic and the Nuggets are gonna figure that out. And I think the fact that, that the Lakers weren't able to steal this one, I just think it's all good. So I guess maybe I just... I think I, you're probably right. It's probably better to be shaken, to be like, hey, this isn't going to be easy. Yep. Um, I, I guess I just didn't like the way it made me feel. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so game two of that one, a huge game, of course, for the Lakers. Uh, that is Thursday night. Uh, we're going to be doing a playback for that one. Sean and Joey from the round ball rock podcast. We'll be anchoring that one. I will probably drop in as well. We're doing the second half of Lakers nuggets in our playback room, playback.tv slash. That's tonight, John boy. Um, John Burr might try to clear his schedule or maybe not. Um, I love the, I love the playback so much. I want to participate in all of them, even the uh, Euro league ones. Oh, I'm doing Euro <laughs> league on Friday morning and Sunday morning. Um, also. So, uh, I'm going to watch some Mario Hazonia. And Thomas Sadaransky and, uh, and other blasts from the p- past uh, in the NBA as the EuroLeague goes down. That also will be in our playback room. Um, the exact times of that, I don't have it at my fingertips right now. I'll share that online. Uh, here's my worst thing I'm also going to stick to um, lottery related content. The Trailblazers, they got lucky. They, they jumped up, they got the third pick. Um, but there's a lot of talk. And this is just talk. So I'm gonna do I'm gonna do like a very politician thing. I'm gonna get mad about a fixed situation. Okay. Thank you. Um Sean Hyken, kudos, who co- kudos to you. Kudos to me. Sean Hyken, <laughs> who covers the Blazers, is like, they're probably gonna trade this pick. And I'm like, what? Like, why? And so apparently the, the, the it seems likely or possible the Trailblazers would trade this third pick to bring in uh, another player to play with Dame Lillard, and they're 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 focusing on Mikhail Bridges. They would trade the third pick. According to Sean, he thinks they would trade the third pick to the Nets for Mikhail Bridges. Now, if you're going to tank, if you're going to shut down Damian Lillard, who's headed towards an all NBA first team finish, the point of tank, the point of tanking is to win the lottery. And they did it. They got the third pick. Yeah. The point of getting the third pick is to get a guy who we have team control of for like nine years. That's the entire point. Couldn't you have traded your first rounder for Mikhail Bridges without having to do the whole tanking thing? Well, you could have. You tanked the last two seasons. You got Shaden Sharp. Now, you, you again, you won. The tanking won. You ended up with a top three pick. The entire point of tanking is to get. Take your door prize. Is to, yeah, <laughs> is to swing for the fences and hit a home run in the lottery, not trade it for a guy who's never made an all-star team. Not traded for a guy to help Damian Lillard in his final four seasons. This young guy you're supposed to draft is supposed, you're supposed to do it. No, yeah, like no, if dude. you didn't want to tank, trade everything for Mikhail Bridges two years ago. 
no disrespect to Sean Hyken, who we've had on here and is super nice, but maybe he's just really deeply con- in- in- in crazily wrong because this doesn't make any sense. I mean, he's connected. He's not. He's not saying it's his opinion that he, they should. He's saying maybe, based may- on what he's seen. Maybe and you heard. just leave that info out there to see if you get some kind of insane Kevin Durant style yeah. offer. I mean, the idea of Mikhail Bridges alongside Damon Lillard is great, but like, is that a title contender? No, it's no. not. No, it, you you traded a first for Jeremy Grant. He's an unrestricted free agent. You traded away Josh Hart for a pick. It was a nice move for a tanking team. That's what you're supposed to be grabbing assets. But if you're not going to trade Damon Lillard, which is that's its own conversation, if you're going to keep Damon Lillard, which I'm on this board is very with, very confusing. Yeah, you're supposed to take your top three pick, use it on somebody, and hope you get an All NBA guy that you have for the next nine years. This and was you can a, play alongside Damon Lillard. This was a twice in a lifetime lotto. Yeah. That everyone went all in trying to do poorly. Right. They have a shot. At the, the top three was what you wanted to get in. Those are the three guys. Well, initially it was. Now there's all the kinds of names. Now that I'm learning about the names, it's like. And then what and what names they are. What about like, like if Scoot Henderson goes Amen to you. Thompson. There's there's talks about the Hornets maybe not wanting Scoot Henderson, who has been like the. Locked in at two for a long time. That seems stupid. And went he went toe to toe with Women Yama in that whatever that G League exhibition in, in Las Vegas. Like if you can get Scoot to play with Dame, beautiful. I mean, trade trade Anthony Simons, guys. Get something for him. You don't need him. But like you're, you're back on your, you're back on poor Anthony. <laughs> Trailblazers, you won the thing. Again, I'm 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 getting mad about a fictional situation. Um, doing my best politician uh, imitation. So, uh, that's my worst thing. Um, before we get to our kudos segment, John, we've already hit a, some of these croissants, but let's do. Uh, we got one more. The croissant questionnaire. Mike F asks, "Would the Warriors have won the championship if they replaced Jordan Poole, or Ann Poole, as I call him, with Bruce Brown?" So, by the way, Mike, who asks the question, was was very upset with our Dran pool. We thought no O or D in Jordan. He thought no J, no D isn't even better. I, don't, I think he it's has a fine. point. It's either way. When you either shoot way. worse than Dylan Brooks, you, you don't deserve that, J. Get right. out of here. That's right. Um, would the Warriors have won the championship if they replaced Jordan Poole with Bruce Brown? No, the Warriors suck. <laughs> <laughs> they they beat a they beat a bad. I'm gonna go with yes. Got sunned. <laughs> I'm gonna go with yes. I'm gonna go with yes. Bruce Brown would have been the sauce. Steve Kerr after the series with the Lakers was like, "We're not a championship team. I get out of here." Yeah, like you could have won a championship if your guys played better. If Clay Thompson doesn't have three straight garbage games, you're gonna win Clay one Thompson, of those. Clay Thompson's shot selection in that playoffs was so bad that it changed. My perception of him as a player forever. Changed my perception of him as a human. Um, <laughs> if Clay Thompson I love Bruce and, Brown, but no, no, I don't. If think Clay Thompson and Jordan Poole aren't literally garbage and Kevon Looney is not sick, all those things happened and they lost in six. Steve Kerr being like, oh, we're not a championship team. Also, Steve Kerr being like, oh, yeah, I couldn't play Kaminga. I have no regrets about not playing Kaminga and Moses Moody more because they weren't <laughs> ready. The dude played Anthony Lamb. All the Clippers, season. the Clippers situation with Teron Lou and the Warriors situation with Steve Kerr are the two most interesting. Maybe these are uh, nightmarish fighting families situations in the league for me. Like I feel like something is just off. I don't think I don't think the Warriors are that far away. Um, f- to act to act like we didn't get there. Yeah, you didn't get there, but you're not that much worse than the Lakers or the Nuggets or the heat or the Celtics. And I do think having one more guy who would be perfect in their system. I think Bruce Brown would be amazing. Um, I think Bruce Brown them. is one of those players who is good on any team. I agree with that. Um, but I also don't think he is good enough to make them championship contenders. I think he's better. I think he's, I think he's way better than Jordan Poole. I think he's better than Dante. I, cer- I, I think he's better agree. than Gary Payton too. They were starting and leaning on Gary Payton too. They like played Dante a lot of men. I mean, I just feel like Bruce Brown's better. Again, we're talking about small margins. Maybe not. Maybe it's not enough to overcome teams are better than you, but like, I think the Warriors were right there. And if you replace a negative, which Jordan Poole is a negative with a strong positive in Bruce Brown for the sake of content, he says yes. As, as, as much as I love Bruce Brown, I don't think he swings the 
the, the he doesn't ch- he's not doesn't create enough barometric pressure to to change their faith. That is as correct of an answer as like you were. For, for instance, if I if Bruce Brown gets injured in this series, yeah, I still think the Nuggets will win. That's a good point. You're as correct here as you were wrong in picking Keldon Johnson over Jalen Williams. Um, Fair (laughs) enough. Those were our (laughs) listener submitted questions. If you have a question you want answered, you have to become a Patreon supporter. By the way, shout out to uh, Charles Crabtree. I think that's your name. The very least, your name is definitely Charles, who joined the Patreon and asked me a very good question about rappers and uh guns and adam silver and all-star game performances and i'm going to tell you right now charles i do not possess the requisite knowledge to answer your question with any nuance or um uh, <laughs> humor <laughs> accuracy or humor so brilliant question you sent i don't know how to answer it um you got to ha- ask somebody smarter but if you want to support our show and get your question on air you have to be a patreon supporter patreon.com slash fast break breakfast also uh for three dollars a month you can join our slack channel it is the most exclusive collection of listeners and uh, hardcore NBA fans. Uh, We talk about everything around the clock. So if you want to support our show, get in on the Slack, patreon.com slash fast break breakfast. All right, no awards segment. We already did that on Tuesday in the show you were out for, John, but we can do a kudos to me. Who? Game six, Clay. Game six, Clay won. I mean, three three for 19. Say it proud. Three for 19. Clay Thompson won the International Stackhouse of Pancakes Award this week. Uh, Kudos to me. If only he had gotten to four so you could. uh... So you could have made a, a he he a missed four he missed he missed four squared shots. Um, oh, okay, okay. I I made many memes, John. The um, the kudos to me segment is in honor of Dylan Brooks, who said kudos to me when he uh picked up five assists in a game. The the kudos to me, John. What's something you got right that you would like to recognize yourself for and pat yourself on the back? Um, I feel like the playoff performances of each player have solidified the justification I had in casting my imaginary MVP vote for Nikola Jokic over Joel Embiid. Joel Mm. Embiid's one of my very favorite players. I saw every second of his collegiate career. I followed him uh, closely. I think he's super awesome, but I think anyone who voted for him over Nikola Jokic uh, their vote should be stricken from the record and taken away. (laughs) I mean, you, we are, we are tempted right now to take a a game one of the conference finals victory lap. Uh, Jokic did have a 30, 20, 10 game. There's only been four of those in NBA history. Kareem has one. Wilt has one. Jokic has two. Uh, the first three quarters were some of the best basketball I've ever seen. I, um, if he had completed it, I mean, that's just one you leave on the DVR forever. Yeah. I still so, might. <laughs> when we talked about the MVP race, which we tried to avoid for most of the season, that's what everyone else does. But when we talked about it in the regular season, one thing that I highlighted as I do my own uh, victory lap after one game of the conference finals, one thing I highlighted was, here's an argument I don't understand that I keep hearing. Why do we vote the MVP for the player that we don't agree is the best player in the game? This was usually a pro Giannis argument. Like, everyone agrees Giannis is the best player. Why isn't he ahead of the MVP race? And I raised my hand and said, I think Jokic is the best player in the game. I think Jokic is the best player. He's He might be the best one-on-one player, okay? Yeah. He doesn't have the quote-unquote bag, but, like, he's the best one-on-one scorer. you You can make an argument that the only thing Jokic that is holding Jokic back is his unselfish play. Because I have gotten to the point where when he has the ball, I'm like, please just score. He shoots, he shoots from the mid-range like Kevin Durant. Yeah. He sh- he made over 60% of his field goal attempts this year. I, I think, think he might be the best one-on-one player, and I he's also, also the best passer, and he's seven feet tall. I think he's kind of good at defense now, too. <laughs> he is, I think he is kind of good at defense. The effort is high, and the understanding of what he should be doing is there. Sometimes he doesn't get there. But the fact that the effort and the intelligence also, is there is huge. People talk about him not being as athletic as some other players. Incredibly athletic. He is more athletic than Joel Embiid. Certainly. He is, maybe you say athleticism is not the same as conditioning, as aerobic ability, because conditioning, Jokic, so much better shape than Joel Embiid's ever been in. Mm-hmm. Jokic is in unbelievable shape. Yeah. 
plays plays entire games regularly. Doesn't matter. He's a thoroughbred. Here's my kudos to me, John. He draws the carriage. Go on. As we as we as we as we take our as we pat ourselves on the back for loving Jokic. I mean, I pointed out on Twitter about the Nuggets plus minus with Jokic like seven years ago. <laughs> kudos to me. Um, last, uh, I'm, I'm watching this Heat series, and they have guys like Caleb Martin. Okay, and Caleb Martin Love is great. Caleb Martin. And he's the type of guy every team would want. And he makes him. He makes nothing. Nothing. And the Heat were very limited in the amount they could have offered Caleb Martin in the offseason. Duncan Robinson makes everything. <laughs> and I was like, surely. You know, because every in retrospect, it seems obvious. In retrospect, everyone's like, oh, why didn't anyone sign this guy? Why didn't anyone sign Josh Kogi or Caleb Martin or even Cody Martin. And I'm like, well, surely on my podcast, Grits and Grinds, I highlighted Caleb Martin as a free agent target for the Grizzlies. You bet I did. You bet I said, why don't we go get this guy? Every team would want him. I also said, hey, why don't we go get like a Gary Payton too? I even said, hey, you know who should target? It would be kind of weird. Kavon Looney. Because he's going to make nothing. And the Warriors can't re-sign him. Basically, I thought you said Javon Carter for a second there. And I got very excited. I suggested, you know what? I, I listened to this episode this morning, just double checking. I, I suggest he was K- Javon Carter was on my list. I said we need a backup too. I also said Javon Carter's mom. I also said if we uh if we don't re-sign Tyus and wave and stretch Danny Green, we could throw the bag at Miles Bridges. Okay, I was wrong there. That was a bad one. That was a bad that was no kudos to me there. That wasn't that wasn't the best idea. Um, but why don't teams want a guy like Caleb Martin? This guy's great. He I makes love six. Him. He makes six and a half million dollars this year. Anyone he could have signed him. He would have done the same foul on George, on uh, Gary Payton too, and just not injured him. Yeah, I don't. I mean, also the Grizzlies didn't use their MLE last season. They uh they had the lowest payroll of all playoff teams. Anywho, um. Kudos to me. I identified some guys that would have helped. Uh, and now they're playing in the conference finals. I mean, Bruce Brown. I tweeted Bruce Brown. Unbelievable signing for the Nuggets. The second it happened. Uh, that guy makes nothing also. Anyways, uh, John, let's wrap this up with a par fadeaway. What thing are you looking forward to in the coming week? Besides the obvious, uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting to t- tune in to some Euro basketball playbacks. Yes, sir. So I'm looking at the schedule. It looks like uh, 1 p.m. on Friday. You're going to be watching Central. so many guys who look like they should be in the town. Real Madrid and Barcelona. We're going to do that game in our playback room. It looks like Kudos I'm doing the, to you, Real Madrid. <laughs> um, uh, there's the Olympiacos game at 9 a.m. I might be able oh, to do that again. Keep I'll, going. I'll, as we get closer to the uh, I really wish Wade Baldwin Ford was still playing. His team got eliminated. Um I still follow him on Instagram. It's very exciting to watch. Uh, uh, yeah. So jo- join us for, for join us for your league. Also, of course, join us on Thursday night in the playback room. Sean and Joey from Round Ball Rock will be in there as we watch the second half of Lakers Nuggets. My part fadeaway, John. Beyond all this, it seems like uh, Bob Myers is on his way out. Maybe in Golden State, they sent Mike Dunleavy. To, is there a GM representative? Joey and Sean tell me. Yeah. Uh, the Joe Lacob. Maybe trying to lowball Bob Myers or not going to re-sign him. Bob Myers has been a tremendous GM for the Warriors. Of course, everything's easier when you have Steph Curry. Maybe a new set of eyes, a new opinion can be good for the Warriors. But seems like they're going to not maybe spend to pay for Bob Myers. So just everything that keeps going on. Front offices getting kind of shuffled around. Of course, there's the coaching um, carousel where lots of coaching jobs are available. Um, so I'll keep I'm keeping my eye on all of that. Also, of course, now that the draft order is set, let's get these trades going, boys. Please let's start. Let's start. Uh, let's start getting some fake trades. Come on, where's a uh, Jake Fisher? Give me some. Give me some. Let me let me turn my alerts back on for you, and uh, <laughs> and let's get some. Uh, let's get some of that trade chatter uh, going. Anyways, uh, if you're a Grizzlies fan, you live in the Memphis area, you can get your 2023 2024 Grizzlies season tickets uh, right now. Lock in the best seats uh, for the biggest matchups at the lowest prices all season long. For more information, visit grizzlies.com slash season tickets or call 901-888-HOOP today. Also, kudos to me, John. Kudos to you, John. Uh, didn't mention John Morant one time. Kudos to us. 
Uh, kudos, kudos to. Didn't wear a John Morant shirt us. yesterday. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I think I'm wearing. Yeah, I'm. Uh, uh, I think I wore one yesterday as well. We, we were twins. Didn't even know it. We uh, anyways, want to support our show? Do that at Patreon.com/slash Fast Break Breakfast. Make sure you s- subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Fast Break Break. You guys are the best. Thanks for listening, and remember, breakfast is the most important thing.